When I was a little kid, I'd heard of two ships, two ocean liners that had met with catastrophe. Now, one of them was the Titanic, who sank in 1912. But as for the other one, 100 years ago today, on May 7th, 1915, the passenger ship Lusitania was torpedoed and sunk by a German U-boat, sending 1,198 men, women, and children to their deaths. I'm Indy Nidell. This is The Great War. The big news last week was the landings at Gallipoli, which quickly descended into a slaughter on all sides. Turkish, Arab, Australian, British, French, and New Zealander. Tens of thousands of men were successfully landed, but the Ottomans remained in firm control of the Straits. Further north, the Austro-Hungarian army was preparing for a new offensive with German guidance and support. The Germans had been thwarted in the west, and the Armenians in Van were still under siege. But there was a lot going on this week, too. And for a change of pace, let's look at the USA to start the week. On May the 1st, New York newspapers published an ad sent them by the German embassy in Washington that read, quote, Travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and Great Britain. The zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles, and that ships flying the British flag are liable to destruction in those waters, and that travelers sailing do so at their own risk. This warning appeared next to an ad for the British Cunard Line's ship, the Lusitania, which set sail that day. The Lusitania was the fastest passenger ship in service across the Atlantic, a real luxury liner, much like the Titanic, and also much like the Titanic, did not have enough lifeboats in case of disaster. Actually, the Lusitania had four fewer than the Titanic. Thing is, this was a common practice, for it was expected that if you sank, it would be in the shipping lanes where you could get help. So the Lusitania set sail for Europe. On the night of May 6th and the morning of May 7th, ship's captain William Turner received six warnings from the British Admiralty about U-boat activity in the area that had sunk two British merchant ships without warning. Turner was advised to travel at full speed and make a zigzag course. Now, I've talked a bit about this before, but I'll say it again. A submarine had to surface to fire its torpedoes, and its surface speed was no match for a dreadnought or an ocean liner like Lusitania. So traveling at top speed in a zigzag course pretty much made it impossible for these ships to be sunk by a sub. Well, Turner didn't heed the advice. He had even dropped his speed and was traveling on a straight path. Now, sub U-20, the one that sunk the merchant ships a day earlier, spotted the cruiser Juno around noon on the 7th, but Juno was zigzagging at top speed. So U-20 gave up the chase, and about 90 minutes later, sighted the Lusitania off the southwest coast of Ireland. A single torpedo was fired, and the Great Liner sank in 18 minutes. Of roughly 2,000 passengers, 1,198 drowned. Of them, 128 or 124 or 114 were Americans, depending which source you believe. The sinking shocked America, but President Wilson refused to abandon neutrality. The Germans officially apologized, though many German papers wrote proudly of the sinking of enemies who bore responsibility for their own risk. Captain Turner, by the way, survived after being washed off the bridge. Former American President Theodore Roosevelt wrote a book arguing for rapid American rearmament and a huge naval construction program and warned that what befell Antwerp and Brussels will surely someday befall New York, San Francisco, and may happen to many an inland city also if the USA did not prepare for war. Later in the year, Germany would officially place passenger liners off-limits for U-boats. But for right now, American public opinion was inflamed, and many Americans who had pushed for neutrality were now changing their minds. But while foreign opinion wasn't going so well for the Germans this week, the actual fighting certainly was. In the West, at the ongoing Second Battle of Ypres, the Germans had driven back the British early in the week with repeated poison gas attacks, and on May 5th, recaptured Hill 60, which they had lost two weeks ago. But the big German victories this week were happening way over on the Eastern Front. 
On May the 1st, the combined Austro-German offensive began under German General August von Mackensen. The initial assault was preceded by a bombardment from 610 big guns, the largest scale attack so far in the east, and it included gas shells. In four hours, 700,000 shells were fired. The offensive was an immediate success. In the first day, the Russians were driven from Gorlice, five days later driven out of Tarnov. The Russians had made advances for eight months. All of those advances were erased in under a week, as the Carpathian passes, one by one, fell to the attackers. 30,000 Russian prisoners of war were taken this week. See, Mackinson had been very clever. The attacks launched in the north and south in April had been diversions, while his forces had gathered near Krakow. The Russians had also ignored intelligence reports of the German buildup, too busy hatching their own plans to break through the Carpathians. So Mackensen had managed to assemble an attack with a force of 300,000 men and 1,700 big guns. In Berlin, the thinking was now that this push was just a prelude to total victory over the Russians. And there was a petition to the German Chancellor Bethmann Holweg from the six largest German economic and industrial groups with demands for once the war was won. These included in the West, Belgian economic and military dependence on Germany, the French coastline as far south as the River Somme, the coal-producing region of northern France, and in the east, part of Russia's Baltic provinces and a huge chunk of land to the south of them, so that the addition of manufacturing resources in the west would be balanced in the east. The area demanded contained a population of 11 million people. But no one was going to agree to that, so victory would have to come on the field. And one field where no one was yet claiming victory was at Gallipoli. On the 1st, the Turks attacked the Allied positions. On both the 2nd and the 4th, the British attacked and failed at Gaba Tepe. And on May 6th, the Second Battle of Krithia began. That village and the nearby hill Ahi Baba were necessary to capture in order to advance up the peninsula. But much like the landings last week, it was a bloodbath. Of the 25,000 or so Allied troops attacking, roughly a third became casualties. And though small gains were made, the objectives remained out of reach. However, losses like that could not realistically continue, or the Allies would soon run out of men to hold their own ground. But the battle plan was a joke. The attackers didn't actually know where the Ottomans were fortified, having not done reconnaissance. So the preliminary artillery bombardment was just a waste of shells. British commander Sir Aylmer Hunter Weston cemented his reputation for incompetence at this battle. Indeed, he is known today as one of the worst generals of the war overall. He would soon be promoted to lieutenant general. One Allied advance that was making headway this week was in German Southwest Africa, as South African forces occupied Ochimbigwe and Karibib. South African Prime Minister and General Louis Botha complained publicly about the Germans poisoning the local wells. The German commander admitted the fact, but said that the wells were marked poisoned, so it was, you know, okay. And that was the week. The Germans spectacularly successful in the East, performing well in the West and losing ground in Africa. And another bloodbath at the Dardanelles and thousands of people drowning in the sea. But I'm not talking about the Lusitania, for that wasn't the only sinking this week. On May the 1st, a British submarine penetrated the Dardanelles and sank a Turkish troop transport with 6,000 troops aboard. 6,000 three times the amount of people on the Lusitania. But you don't hear about that sinking. They weren't civilians. They were soldiers. They were cannon fodder. They were insignificant. But they were men. And one of the most famous poems of the war was written this week, in 1915, by John McRae, a Canadian doctor in the Canadian Medical Corps, which he wrote after seeing the wreckage of Ypres. And it was for all of those insignificant soldiers who died. In Flanders' fields the poppies grow, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. 
Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. If you'd like to see more about what was happening in Flanders fields, click here to see the beginning of the first Battle of Ypres. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Ian Gendler or Gendler. Sorry if I get it wrong. If you want to know more about how you can support our show, check out our Patreon page. And for more pictures of World War I, follow us on Instagram. See you next time.